So the fur functions are one of the most useful and in my opinion, the most powerful features you could possibly use in Golang. They are simple yet really powerful. The defer keyword is pretty similar to the finally construct in other OOP programming languages, but it is even more powerful than that. That's why we are going to look at three possible use cases you could use in your next Golang project to improve your code in Go. Oh, and if you're new here, my name is Flow. I'm a professional software engineer and on this channel we do everything related to the software engineering world. So before starting, let's quickly clarify what even the defer keyword means in Golang. Now generally the defer keyword in Golang means that there is somehow a deferred processing mechanism that executes a function before the current function returns. And an important characteristic is that this defer keyword always runs in lethal order, so last in first out, which basically means that the most recently executed function always executes first. Now, this defer keyword or these defer functions or operations are pretty common in Golang code and you will pretty much see them everywhere. For instance, for closing resources or closing the connections to databases. So you can use this defer keyword for anything you want, but it's pretty common to use that to clean up resources in your application. So let's quickly get into the first use case of this defer keyword. All right, so the first use case would be to just read a file. So read the entire contents of this file and then just basically close this file again, because this is really important to always clean up your resources and in this case to close your file. So for that, we are going to create a new function. Let's call it read file. And this function takes in an argument, which is called path name, for instance, or we can also call it file name. And this function can return an error because we always want to propagate these errors to the executor of this function to not deal with these errors in our read file function. Now, how are you going to apply this? It's pretty simple. We are just going to say read file. And then we are going to specify the file name in here, which we are going to say output.txt. And obviously we can handle the error here by just using a simple statement. So if error is not equal to nil, then we are pretty much printing this error. Obviously there are better ways to handle these errors, but like I said, this is just for demonstration purposes. Okay, let's get started by opening a file. Right, because obviously when we want to read the contents of a file, we first need to open it. So for that, we are going to say file and error and then use the os.open function, which pretty much opens a file for IO operations. So we can, for instance, read the contents or write something to it. Now this open function restricts us to just reading the contents. So not writing any content at all, only to read the contents here. And then we're going to say file name, obviously. Now then, if the error is not equal to nil, we are just going to return error here. And then we can basically read the contents. Now for that, I'm going to make use of the IO read all function here. And this read all function takes in a reader interface. So if you're going to look at the read all function, we do have a reader here, which in the end is an interface. Now in here, we are just going to say file because file in the end implements this interface. And then we are going to make use of this error statement here again, and we propagate the error to the executor of this function. And after that, let's just say that we return nil. And before that, we are going to print the contents. Now data in this case is a byte slice. And with this string, we are going to kind of converting the bytes to a human readable format. So in the end that we can read the contents of the file. Now, one thing that I've actually forgot here is a really important thing to close the file or to close the resource of this file so that it basically is after this function, after the execution, if it's an error or not, basically is unusable for all sorts of IO operations. And here we can make use of the defer keyword. 
Now after we are going to open this file and there's no error, so basically the file exists and is ready for all sorts of IO operations, we are going to say defer and then file.close. Now this line here pretty much means that it defers this execution always to the end of the execution of the read file function. Which basically means no matter if there is an error or not, so for instance if this error here exists, so there is an error while reading the contents of the file, it also going to closes the file so it makes it unusable for additional IO operations. Or for instance if it returns nil here so there is no error, after that it also going to close this file. And this is pretty common practice for all Golang applications to basically clean up your resource. In this case it is a file but it also could be a database connection or something else. Now I think this was a pretty standard use case. Let's quickly look at another use case for measuring the performance of a specific function or for for instance benchmarking a function against another one. So for that let's quickly jump to our main function and then declare a data slice which in this case is just an int slice and here we're going to insert one, two, three, four, five. And after that we are going to call a process data function. And this process data function takes in the data slice. Let's quickly create this function, right? So we can say func and then process data. As an argument we expect the data slice, which is of type in slice. Now and in this function we want to measure the performance or measure the speed of execution of this function. So we can make use of the time module in Golang. So for that I'm just going to say start and then I'm going to say time dot no, which basically returns the current local time of our computer in this case, but it could be also of your server. So now we have our start time and then for instance we are going to make a for loop and iterate over the data. Now let's just say in here we are going to print the data in this case, so the data element and after that we are going to sleep for some time. So let's say we are going to sleep 100 milliseconds after the data gets locked. Now obviously I could just measure the function execution time in the end of this function, but this would be pretty unhealthy in terms of readable code, right? Because I want to know instantly what actually happens with the start time here if it's not used in our main business logic. Now obviously let's just say that this function can enhance and the more code gets into this function, obviously the lower this kind of performance measurement gets in this function, which is pretty bad. So instead I could just make use of the defer keyword here again and then I can declare a function. Now this thing here is called a deferred anonymous function because we are basically declaring a function that is going to execute immediately after this deferred execution is processed. So basically whenever this process data function ends, this function is also executed. And in here we can just make a simple log statement and here we are going to say data processing completed in now let's just format this here for some better readability. And then we are going to say time.since and we are going to make use of start. Now in this since basically calculates the difference between the start time, which we've declared as time.now and the current time. So in the end, it's pretty much the total execution time of this function, of our process data function. Okay, let's just quickly run this code here to demonstrate actually what happens. And now obviously we get our first hello world from our read file functionality. And then we get one, two, three, four, five back. But in the end, we also get the log statement, which just prints the milliseconds of our total execution time of the process data function. So in the end, this defer function does not get executed right away. It actually gets executed 
at the end of our process data function. So it always executes in the end, no matter what happens here. Now let's just get into a more complex or more advanced example or use case. And that would be to basically recover from panics. Because in the end, these defer functions also get executed no matter if the function panics or not. Now end a panic can occur in Golang whenever something unexpectedly happens in your application. And we are going to simulate this in our application here. So for that, let's just create a new function. Let's call it save operation. And in here, we are going to make a simple print statement, which just says, um, cannot reach this code. And before that print statement, we are just going to panic with an error. Let's just say something went wrong. Now, obviously the Go compiler gives us here a warning that this code is unreachable code, obviously because this does not get executed whenever the panic occurs here. But we can make a defer function. So let's just create our deferred anonymous function here, which also gets executed whenever this save operation completes. And then we are going to make use of the built-in recover function. Now in here, we are also going to check if it's not nil. So if there is somehow a recovering process, so if there was a panic, we are going to execute this if statement. And then we are just going to say print line recovered from panic R. Now what this deferred function now allows us is basically to kind of catch the panic and then recover. So instead of panicking and crashing the application, it continues its operation and execution. So let's just quickly test this code here. And obviously we need to call this function in our main function. And if we're going to run this, we're going to see that obviously our file gets read and the execution time gets calculated. And then we also get a recovered from panic. And this is basically the huge power of the deferred function here, which can recover from panics, which is really, really nice. Now, in the end, I hope you now understand the defer keyword in Go and what actually the purpose is of this thing. And if you're curious about a 15 minute crash course of Golang, then I highly recommend watching this video here, where I quickly explain everything you need to know about Golang and to get started in this lovely programming language. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day and bye bye.